Good afternoon, everyone, and very welcome to this uh, um, webinar, which is jointly organized by um, EMEA, the Euro Mediterranean Economist Association, and, and SEPS. Uh, the event is titled Europe After the War uh, What Next for Pan European, Euro Mediterranean, and EU African Integration? And then I'm Cinzia Cidi, I'm Director of Research at SEPS, Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels. And I'm extremely pleased to, to, to moderate um, this webinar. We have an excellent lineup of, of speakers. I'm really looking forward to, to listen to, um, to their thoughts and their ideas. Now, before I do that, um, let me uh, give you a bit of background about this event. Uh, the event uh, is inspired by a book. Let me uh, show you the book, uh, which uh, um, will be uh, available for free download uh, on uh, EMEA and on SEP's uh, website. Uh, so this is the book, this is the cover of, of the book. Uh, for those who are interested, please visit uh, uh, one of the two uh, websites and, and download it. Uh, it is uh, edited by Rima Yadi, Paolo Garona and uh, Goran uh, Zvilanovic. They are all present in, uh, in this webinar. I will introduce them properly in a, in, in a moment and they will tell us more um, about the book. But uh, um, if you allow me maybe to, to put uh, uh, the book into, into context, uh, given that this is a, um, um, a compilation of, of contribution looking at many different um, aspects, ranging from energy to next generation EU, to, to finance, to Euromed uh, integration, to EU-Africa relations and, and investment. Um, however, the, the, the starting point, uh, and uh, if you want, the, the general theme is that the, uh, the war in, in Ukraine, other than leading to energy crisis in, in Europe and uh, rippling effects, uh, is basically changing quite fundamentally the, the global order. And is basically changing um, uh, the global order and raising challenges for, for Europe, which uh, are rather unprecedented. Um, it basically uh, leads to, to a very fundamental question of whether we are moving towards an order, a global order in which, uh, which is not anymore rule-based, but uh, that is dominated essentially by power. And this is a major game changer for Europe, which is typically a soft power. Uh, so uh, uh, a region which basically uh, is managing to, to play its, its role at international level and has managed to prosper uh, because the international setting um, is uh, founded on rules. Uh, moving towards an order where there is a competition of power, mostly of superpowers, especially the, the US and, and China, uh, raises really a, a question of what future the EU will have as a global actor. And this has a number of, uh, uh, if you want, cascade, sort of cascade effects uh, for the EU, both in terms of how to affirm itself, for which it needs to grow. It's very difficult to be a power who has a weight if you do not grow and you're very focused on inner issues. The second uh, set of questions is relates to the EU relations with its neighbors and to what extent and how Europe want to, wants to, to engage uh, with its neighbors, uh, both south and east, and to what extent it wants to fill any vacuum or take any new position compared uh, to the, um, what the global order is, is basically uh, meaningful for these regions. So this is um, a bit the, the, the general framework and the, the general questions which are uh, behind the book. Uh, then the book is, is much more details and there are uh, several chapters uh, which go much more in detail. And basically today uh, we will learn more about uh, um, four chapters. So I would like to, to start um, first uh, by introducing Paolo Garonna, who will give us a, a bit of, of an overview of, uh, of the entire book. Um, I will be rather brief uh, in introducing Paolo. He is very well known. He has a, a great career. Uh, he is a, a professor now of political economy at uh, um, uh, Lewis University in, in Rome. Uh, but in, in the past, it has been uh, 
the Secretary General of the um, Italian uh, Banking Insurance and, and Finance Federation was chief economist at, at Confindustria, uh, so uh, a very well-known uh, economist in Italy, but also outside uh, Italy. Paolo, I would like to give you the floor uh, to give us uh, really an overview of, of the book. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Cinzia, for your nice words. Uh, I Let me share my screen uh, because uh, I have uh, just a few a few slides, and uh, I would like to share them uh, with, with you. And I will start. Uh, I will start from just a second. Uh, I will start from where Cinzia uh, left it, i.e., the book, um, highlighting uh, what she already mentioned. This. Uh, the fil rouge, if you want, the common threads that link together the different uh, the different contributions. First of all, the focus on banks, insurance, and finance, uh, and the role of the private sector. Um, this reflects uh, obviously the fact that many of the contributors uh, have been involved in the financial sector, but also the belief that uh, public finance is not enough uh, to bridge. Uh, we have huge financing and protection gaps. To bridge them, it's important that uh, we mobilize private savings, we channel those savings towards investment and infrastructure, small and medium enterprises. And the second thing is the, uh, the belief that uh, we need a new approach to European integration. We need uh, uh, somehow a, a new Europe. Um, and not, not only economic, financial integration, but also social, political, peace, and security. The EU um, has become and will be a source of moderation, prosperity, stability, and democracy, um, not only for the whole European continent, uh, but for the world. So the new Europe, and Cinzia said it very well, um, the new Europe um, is and must be a global Europe. This, also justifies why we have a manifesto in the book. We want to promote the dialogue, somehow a continuation of the conference on the future of Europe and mobilize, um, if you want, um, the civil society and the intellectuals um, on, on this. Um, why a new Europe? Once again, I think Cinzia said it very well. Uh, everything has changed after the war. The war has represented a watershed moment. Uh, it added and interacted with previous crisis, crisis, the financial crisis, the financial volatility. By the way, we are in the middle of another episode of financial um, volatility linked uh, to the cost of living uh, crisis and linked to the war. And, and then uh, we, we have the pandemic, we had the energy and food security and, and the whole um, international relations uh, framework uh, has been undermined because the basic values underpinning uh, the, the world order, you know, the UN charter, the principles uh, there and uh, human rights uh, uh, have been put into question by the, the, uh, the Russian aggression. Um, but to look also more positively towards the future, the war has also triggered a European moment, a, a new centrality of, of Europe, which is based on two things, basically one, is the effective response to the crisis by Europe. Uh, Europe has shown united support for Ukraine. Um, what we have achieved in terms of energy diversification only in a few months, uh, frankly, you know, one year ago, we, 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 uh, we were very fearful about this, but I mean, what we have achieved is remarkable. Um, we, uh, we, we are taking, Europe is taking a new leadership role in international relations. Let me just mention COP27 in Egypt, and the historic breakthrough there uh, on loss and damage, which was, um, you know, the, the result of European diplomacy, European taking the lead, also the Bridgetown Initiative that has been launched there. So for many reasons, I think uh, there is uh, a new centrality of Europe in the global exchequer. Um, and and, um, and this role is, is growing. Um, why? You, you may wonder, well, because uh, Europe is a soft power, Cinzia said it very well, but, uh, you know, soft power is also an advantage because in a world divided by muscular and, uh, and uh, rivalrous superpowers, you need also the soft power, the power of reason, the power of diplomacy. Uh, Europe is more open um, than other continents to sharing sovereignty. I mean, we know the Anglo-Saxon world has a problem with sharing 
jurisdiction, sovereignty, think, so, think of Brexit, think of the international tribunals, um, uh, think of the appellate body of WTO, which is blocking the reform of, and, and the working of dispute settlement at WTO. Um, um, also, the European approach to integration is value driven. I mean, the values, which are European values, but also universal values of liberal democracy, the rule of law, human rights, and multilateralism, um, uh, and trade and, and investment liberalization. Just consider the difference between the IRA um, um, and the Green New Deal, I mean, the, the industrial plan. I mean, these, these are, they have similar objectives, but they are very different. Um, so to respond to this call and deliver, uh, Europe, uh, the European Union, needs major reforms to strengthen its incomplete and fledgling institutional architecture. So we, we need after you know, the watershed moment and the European moment, we need a third moment, a Hamiltonian moment, a moment of institutional reforms. And there are four main headings, uh, the enlargement, the deepening of the union, the pan-European dimension of integration, uh, looking towards the east and towards the south, uh, and uh, finally the EU-Africa relations. And I will finish by mentioning uh, a few sentences on each of these four uh, major dimensions of European uh, reform. In one word, Europe is becoming a new indispensable nation, you know, like the US, um, a community of faith. But to, 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 to be there, uh, she needs to engage in reforms. Uh, and the first one is the enlargement. Now, the candidate status to Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia um, was a remarkable achievement. Uh, uh, this has unblocked the accession process after the stalemate um, in the Balkans. And But there are also more countries waiting at the door to, to get into the EU, in the Balkans, in the Mediterranean, uh, and, and the others. We need a new approach to the enlargement, uh, an approach that is less bureaucratic, uh, less box ticking, uh, and more open, more welcoming, more supportive. You see the first reaction um, by many to the candidate status for these countries has been, ah, we'll take a long time. It's not very encouraging. I mean, if I go into my classroom and I tell my class, you know, you are going to have difficult exams and it's take you a long time, um, to get there, uh, that's that's not the kind of things you want to say to to students. Uh, and and I think you know, it it's like you know, Europe has, has behaved this kind of this kind of attitude of some teachers. You know that uh, they sit back and mark exams, uh, but they don't teach. They don't engage, in particular, in teaching. Uh, so it's not a question of diluting the standards, compromising on values. On values, there should be any compromise. But we should be supportive, you, we should be welcoming, we should say clearly and believe that having a larger, a stronger and more united Europe is better than having uh, a smaller, uh, a weaker and uh, fragmented European Union, which is a Malthusian approach that uh, often we, we have taken. Um, this needs uh, um, overcoming veto powers and having qualified majority voting, which might involve the reform of the treaties, um, but also the belief that there is no trade-off between widening and deepening. This has been an excuse for not moving onwards on the enlargement. Uh, why the US works well with 50 member states where Europe fears to become larger. So I think uh, the obstacle is it's not there. The obstacle is, uh, is, is another one. Um, on uh, deepening and strengthening, uh, on deepening and strengthening the union, um, uh, we have to say that uh, the war has unveiled uh, Europe's institutional vulnerabilities, which must, must now be addressed and, uh, you know, go very quickly because these are issues uh, that have been discussed. A stronger executive function, a more robust fiscal capacity, a new budget, own resources, European uh, public goods uh, in the area of technology, energy, research, infrastructure, and foreign policy and defense. So we need institutional reforms, bold institutional reforms, and the discussions underway on the um, growth and stability pact, on the debt uh, agency, on the strategic compass, uh, go in that direction, but we must accelerate um, uh, the pace uh, of engagement in reforms. Uh, the third 
dimension is the leap forward in pan-European integration. We have learned, I mean, also thanks to the war, how important is Eastern Europe uh, for our own security. Um, and, and how important is also the Euro-Mediterranean as a source of energy and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and other resources. Um, now, if Europe has the ambition of taking a global role, uh, it must start in Europe itself. It must start in its backyard, in its own, uh, in its own region. So we need European leadership and responsibility in the pan-European uh, space. Now, the promising aspect on this is that we have a new player. Uh, we have this new European political community. You remember it was launched uh, recently in Prague. Uh, we are going to have the second meeting in June in Chisinau in Moldova. It would be very important to have a meeting there because you know the, what's happening there is very threatening uh, in there in Georgia. Um, and uh, um, the idea um, it was uh, President Macron who started the process, but it was supported also by all other countries is to have a forum for pan-European political dialogue for strategic discussions about the future of Europe. That's what's written in the mission uh, statement of this new, um, new forum, but also uh, as an anti-chamber for potential and actual candidate countries to prepare for accession and reform. We should not repeat there the mistake we did um, with the Union for the Mediterranean that was uh, um, um, received and some, somehow also intended uh, as an alternative to, to accession uh, rather than as a complement and a support for accession. And finally, we need an important role for the financial sector. Uh, finally, um, the last uh, but not least dimension uh, on which I think RIM is going really to focus, we need a new neighborhood and a new long-term friendship in the relationship between the EU and Africa. You see, the war has shown uh, how poor are the relations between the EU and Africa. We have, we have had recently another vote at the UN General Assembly on the, uh, on the Russian aggression. And uh, uh, like one year ago, uh, the majority of um, African countries uh, abstained. Um, and and uh, we even had uh, one more country, you know, add into the list of the, so we have seven uh, countries who, who, who voted against it. Um, so we need to reset it. We need a new friendship relationship. Now, you may think that is in this hard world of international relations, the concept of friendship is a bit soft um, uh, for economists. Uh, um, I disagree with that. And I think after, um, uh, you know, the Secretary of the Treasury uh, spoke of friend shoring, uh, we, we now uh, have come to perceive how hard, uh, in terms of economic and political implications, is the concept of friendship, and uh, and uh, because it involves a lot of um, a lot of elements in the in the relationship, the recovery and resilience programs in support of green, digital, and security transition, support for countries that are in debt distress and balance of payment disequilibrium, and uh, you know we we hope that we can have a European monetary fund uh, like the. Uh, international Monetary Fund who could help those countries, uh, support for Pan-African Union in their, um, in their attempt to, to, to trade, investment, uh, monetary and political union, um, a partnership in the Afro-Mediterranean and Euro-Mediterranean integration. The Mediterranean belongs to both Africa and to, uh, and to um, Europe. It's a bridge between Europe and, and Africa, and, and we should be involved, uh, the North Shore and the Southern Shore, in, in both processes. And uh, and I see that, I mean, we even uh, have uh, issued uh, the idea, the provocative idea that Italy might want to join the African Union. I mean, gee, why not? Uh, I think, uh, as President Macron said, that there is an African uh, component in the French identity, in the and that's it's also true for the Italian identity and for the European identity. We need uh, um, consultation and joint initiatives at the multilateral level, at the UN level, at the level of FAO, WHO. Uh, in some, we need a completely new approach and a new narrative, not only based on development aid and technical cooperation. We think that we can go to Africa with our pockets full of euros and solve all problems, uh, but we need uh, uh, 
more than that. We need peer political dialogue and we need financial, economic and social integration. And I will finish by quoting, quoting what Bancole Adeoye, the commissioner of the African Union said um, about the new relationship between um, uh, the EU and Africa. And uh, he said, you know, we, we must really establish a relationship on the same terms that uh, we have the marriage vows um, for better and for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. Uh, that's what it means to be friends. Uh, and uh, till death um, uh, uh, as part. Uh, so I think uh, this is, uh, you know, the secret of the new approach, the secret of the new friendship that we need. I will stop here for time being. Thanks a lot, uh, Paolo, for this very rich overview of, uh, of the themes which are covered in the book, but also of the issues which are at stake. Uh, you called many times for new approach. There is really a need for, uh, for something new to, uh, uh, to be done. Uh, but the long list of, uh, of, of topics and issues, I think it's also indicative of the complexity of, of the situation um, in, in which we are. Now, uh, what we will do with the next three speakers is to go deeper in um, several of the themes that Paolo mentioned. And um, I would like to, to start with uh, Goran uh, Zvilanovic. Uh, Goran is uh, a Serbian politician and, and diplomat. Um, he has a long-standing career. Um, in the two, early 2000s, he was a foreign affair of the then uh, Federal Republic of uh, Yugoslavia, was member of the parliament, and since then uh, he has held a lot of very high-level position in uh, foreign, policies, uh, foreign policy, very active on, in the Balkan regions and uh, uh, in the relations with the EU. Goran, you have uh, a chapter in the book uh, uh, which is called... Uh, uh, EU transformative power. I find it a uh, very powerful uh, title. I would like to, to, to invite you to, to explain what you mean and uh, the way you have been looking at the EU over the years. Floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Cynthia, for a very kind introduction. I'd also like to express my gratitude to Paolo, who has invited me on board. So we've been working together on this book on different elements, including the edition of the book. Uh, well, I'd also like to say a big thank you to Emma and Seps, of course, for organizing this uh, webinar as well as uh, helping us publishing the book. Well, uh, true, I've focused on one issue, and this is related to, well, enlargement policies, transformative power of the EU. But to all of those who are now in this webinar, to all of those who would like to take a look into the book, I would like to say on a very personal level, what I find uh, best elements in the book is something that Paolo has just mentioned, this different look into relationship between U EU, Europe, and Mediterranean, including the North Shores of Africa. So I think this is a novice, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing from Rim today. I think this is an important element. Uh, let me start by simply saying that it is my impression that two most important elements that have been lost by European Union are the transformative power of the enlargement process and the credibility. Well, I'll start with the credibility. Frankly, if you take an example of what happened in North Macedonia after they reached an agreement on the name issue, a big hurdle for them. Uh, agreement reached with the Greece, and I highly appreciate uh, the brave attitude of the government. And then it was not even possible to give them a date to start negotiations, although they've changed the constitution. You know, when this happens, and I was in politics, I used to lead the party, was a minister, I know, I can imagine how it felt uh, for that time, Prime Minister Zayev. So, you know, then you stop believing in the process, you stop trusting the people you are working with because you are paying uh, grave consequences, bold political decisions you are making, and then something which seems to be very simple you don't get because there was a lack of unity among the member states. That's an illustration similarly with Kosovars who have done everything they've been asked when it comes to the visa regime, and they need to wait for another year or two or three 
And only now, actually, only last month, they've been promised that uh, at the end of this year, so in January 2024, they will be able to travel freely, although the commission was saying that they have fulfilled every condition. Well, but it was also important to point out that transformative power is a problematic somewhat because uh, there is, in my article, you will find details, there is a study done by European Stability Initiative, which is very interesting. It shows that some of the countries which are not in negotiations these days are progressing faster than some which are in a process. Then the question is, okay, what happens? We would expect that the process itself, like an Itaka, the process is important, even if you do not eventually join in a year in five or ten, that the process is changing our countries. And now this analysis is showing that actually this is not what is happening. The process stopped transforming societies. And I'm referring at the EU accession process, negotiations, etc. So what is happening then? Uh, leaders in the Western Balkans start hedging, to use this financial terminology, with the European Union and with the process. So this is a reaction that you can see in the countries. Also, a lack of honesty in the political engagement of the leaders from the Balkans. There, I need also to be uh, honest. And then, of course, uh, this situation produced a not really a vacuum, vacuum in the region, but triggered other players to join with their own policies. Well, China was very visible with the, their policy. China's Belt and Road policy. Then you can find uh, different examples also of engagement of other players, so Russia, Turkey, Emirates, etc. So there are other players who are uh, filling this void, I would say. Uh, there are different ideas. And I would like to simply, before introducing these ideas, to say that uh, there are difficult processes that are the one is behind us, hopefully, and this is COVID pandemic, which trigger one process of rethinking within the EU member states. What are critical dependencies for the European Union? And what's been learned is perhaps there should be more of an investment in pharmaceuticals, industry, technology. So obviously there is one uh, revelation, I would say, in, in an unfortunate process. Then the Russian aggression on Ukraine triggered another thinking in the EU, what else we are missing? And obviously it was immediately learned that raw materials are another critical dependency for the EU. And uh, so, well, okay, everyone is looking at Norway, but I'm not sure whether Norway can compensate for what's been lost. And then in this context, there is a look into the region, including into the Balkans, whether the mineral resources coming from Serbia in particular might compensate for some of the minuses which are a result of these geopolitical developments. And I've started with the pandemic and now the war. So this triggered one uh, way of thinking within the EU, which is looking at itself, trying to go through the crisis, uh, trying to somehow respond to the people who are now dissatisfied. There is an energy crisis. There, is, there are issues related to supply chain. There, is, there are issues related to food security. So this is a context in which uh, we are at the moment. But this is normal that the Balkan countries and the leaders are trying to, to see, okay, what are we going to do now? And this is what I would like to present in only a few minutes now. Uh, are principles on which the new thinking should be based. I'd advise to start membership negotiations with all Western Balkan countries immediately. Perhaps, to be honest, Western Balkans plus having in mind also Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, etc. So start engaging with them. And there should be no delay in this process. Then second uh, principle would be to incentivize uh, front runners. So those who are doing more to somehow speed up the process for them and open funding as well. The third would be, in my advice, uh, be decisive in sanctioning of others who misbehave in the process. 
who are either slow or do not want to comply with the EU policies. So this might create a new atmosphere which would lead all of us towards more of economic and political convergence with the EU. And getting very close to what has been advised here, I've simply quoted the European Stability Initiative proposal uh, to go for perhaps more openness towards Montenegro. They are now in election process, but after this, perhaps to, to try to see, this is a small country, the smallest among those who are in the process, to show that the process is alive and to see whether it can be completed in the coming years with the engagement of both sides, the EU, I mean, the member states, European Commission, as well as uh, the leadership in the country, which will be elected after the elections. And this will be a kind of a signal that the process is alive towards everybody else. All of the countries in the region, not only in the Balkans, but those who, who were recently applied. There is another more nuanced approach, which was done by the group of experts uh, gathered by the Erste Foundation. It is called Six Fixes for the Western Balkans, six, because they were looking into this group of countries, and I would like just to list them and then would, of course, be happy to respond to the questions later on. So one of these fix, six fixes is to relentless, uh, relentless focus on the fundamentals. So we stick to the need to, in, uh, to focus on rule of law, democratic standards, and economic reforms in order to promote progress in governance and prevent backsliding this is the first principle. The second one is gradual phasing in of candidate countries in various sectors of the integration. Well, the idea is that the commission in coordination of member states and accession countries should work towards bold proposal for the phasing in of EU policies of mutual interest to all, such as Fit for 55 package on the energy and green transitions. So an example could be also participation in the EU internal market. So there are possibilities to engage the countries in. The third proposal is related to increase socialization, including financial, in European institutions. So the whole idea is that the fulfillment of precise criteria and standards in specific sectors should be rewarded with targeted financial support from the funds now reserved for EU member states. So this would, for instance, um, be enhanced with the candidate country participation in the capacity of observers with the right to contribute to discussions, but without voting rights. Um, greater alignment within a chapter or cluster would translate into greater funds and sets a seat at the table uh, regarding particular processes. So these are the ideas. Then. The fourth among these six fixes is earlier access to structural funds. Well, this has been long ago raised uh, in the Western Balkans because uh, what we have observed is that the gap between the immediate neighbors, say Serbia and Croatia, Croatia is a new member state, Serbia is not, or Serbia, Bulgaria, Bulgaria is a new member state. So if you compare to what extent is the EU member state support to the structural funds to the instruments for pre-accession, which is funding for Serbia, then you see actually that there is a continuation. Instead of convergence with the EU, there is a continuation of deepening of the gap. This is why this has been mentioned. And earlier and gradual increase in financial support would also lead to earlier socioeconomic development benefits and in turn should reduce uh, and the engagement of the other policies, like the China's policies uh, that I mentioned. So it would reduce the region's reliance on Chinese sources of finance, which are leading into uh, the debt. And then the fifth is elevation of foreign security conditionality. The fundamentals and external relations should be the two pillars that determine progress and or backsliding in the accession process. And the last one is streamlining of the decision-making process on enlargement. This has been mentioned by Paolo a few minutes back when he mentioned that there could be a new thought to introduce a qualified majority voting in the, in the process regarding different phases of the process. But of course, when it comes to the uh, bringing country into the EU membership, we would stick 
to the to una, unanimity. When I am discussing this uh, introduction, introducing qualified majority voting in the council, the idea was, say, 55% of member states representing at least 65% of the population. But the general idea is to start uh, to try to see where there is the room of speeding up of the process. Here, I would like to stop, uh, once again, repeating how grateful I am for the opportunity and I'm very much looking forward to the reactions in this webinar or, of course, other reactions after the book is issued and read by everyone. Thank you. Many thanks, Goran. This was really interesting. It was very refreshing somehow to, to hear the, the perspective really from outside the EU and uh, uh, such a, a positive and uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, very concrete suggestions for how to, to take forward the, the enlargement process. Um, I actually have a few questions, but uh, I, will keep it, I will keep them for later. I would like now to move to, to the next speaker, um, Piercarlo Paduan. Uh, Pier Carlo is uh, uh, currently chairman of the board of, of directors at uh, Unicredit uh, SPA, uh, SPA <laughs> I should say. Uh, Pier Carlo has uh, uh, an outstanding uh, career. Uh, he was uh, um, Minister of Economy and, uh, and Finance uh, in Italy. Um, he was uh, um, director at the IMF, uh, Deputy Secretary General of the at the. OECD is uh, uh, an economist with an exceptional career. Um, Pier Carlo, in, in the book, you focus uh, um, on the next generation EU. Uh, so you take a bit more um, internal view or inward looking uh, view at, at the EU, uh, but I think a, a crucial focus on growth. Please, the floor is yours. Yes, thanks very much. Good afternoon to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and thanks for the invitation. Uh, I think that Next Generation EU deserves uh, a deeper scrutiny than what's been achieved so far for two reasons. First of all, it could be a very important and effective model for growth for, European, for the European region as a whole. And number two, it seems to me that it fits with current and recent European problems with, with low growth, which so far we have been dealing with. So I, in, in my slides, which I hope you can, you can see, I will go through uh, some elements of a paper that I've written on trying to link the Next Generation EU project to the existing literature on growth. So Next Generation EU is important because it impacts on new growth mechanism. Uh, it is a way of dealing with the drivers of the twin transformation, and it uh, uh, brings into, uh, into the full light the uh, policy instruments for long-term growth, most notably structural reforms, public investment, and crucially, instruments to activate public private investment as well. Uh, what is the view of growth that I take as a way to insert in this view the impact of next generation EU. It is, a, it is a view of acceleration. The notion of acceleration you may be familiar with is that growth is not to be seen as a linear or rather smooth over the long term development of countries. But especially in emerging economies, and I'll come to that point in a moment, it is rather the sequence of different phases of acceleration themselves generated by institutional change. Now, if you think for a moment about the history of the European economy since the, the notion of European uh, com community and union eventually was developed, you see that this has been a history of a sequence of institutional changes and accelerations. Indeed, what Europe has been doing is to look at crisis as a way to deal with uh, uh, progress in growth and to have accelerations as the outcome and product of institutional change. So it is a sequence in that sense. And I find it very useful. Uh, how does that fit, fit with, the, uh, uh, with, with the growth approach in, in general? Well, if you look at uh, a quick survey of the otherwise very extended 
literature on EU growth explanations in the post-war period, you may come for the purpose of simplicity to the conclusion that there are two factors that impact on long-term growth in Europe. One is institution building itself, new institutions, and the other one is total factor productivity, which is a way of, as you know, of synthesizing the various contributions to productivity growth by the economy, the society, and including the external environment. I'll come to the external environment at the end of my, 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 my remarks. So uh, this is how Europe can be described. And the question then becomes, how is that description fitting with the overall broader growth, uh, growth uh, environment? And my point is very simple. It's been a declining growth rate in Europe over the long term, and a declining growth rate which may have, at some stage, weakened the convergence process, actually generating some divergence at the time of the sovereign rate sovereign crisis in, at the beginning of the past decade. So if, if I were to share with you a model, and forgive me for the confusion of this diagram, I would say that the, two, the, the policy instruments, investment and structural reforms, generate a boost to total factor productivity, which itself feeds back on, on growth and generates a virtuous mechanism. So the message that I want to convey is that next generation EU can be a very effective machine in generating this growth boost and therefore setting the stage for a new phase of, uh, of stronger growth, which of course could be the base for also stronger integration. Uh, secular stagnation has been the name of the game, not just in Europe, but also in other economies for some time. And I think that unfortunately, we are still in that situation in spite of uh, cyclical growth uh, accelerations in the, in the recent past. So if there is secular stagnation behind uh, our, our unsatisfactory growth performance, we need to understand what is behind secular stagnation. And the answer is quickly offered. It is those factors which are at the same uh, time determinants of structural reforms as, and public investment as the necessary response to secular stagnation. Uh, there are also elements which relate to a well-known uh, point in the, in the assessment of European economy, which is misallocation of resources for which institutional uh, innovations such as the single market were, uh, were perceived to be the, the solution. So uh, what is the idea to finish with this point? If there is a, a, a boost to acceleration, initially you will see a lot of investment and capital growth in, uh, in, in the economy, but over the medium term, you will see that TFP, total factor productivity comes in and sustains growth. So the, the, the challenge is not just to boost growth at the beginning, but to have a sustained mechanism knowing that there are a number of channels that generate uh, spillovers of the initial boost, which are fiscal, uh, structural, and also elements related to confidence. Because if the European economy starts to grow sustainably for some time, this will lower other things equal the, the, the risk uh, component in, in growth and therefore boost investment and other growth. One of the elements which are extremely important in this strategy is the role of structural reforms. Structural reforms have been on the playground for economic policy in Europe for a long time. And the, the point I want to sh share with you now is very simple. I think that structural reforms are essential to make the growth mechanism sustained. However, we tend to forget the, that the so-called reform cycle is very long, meaning that from the moment in which a government, any government, uh, announces that they will introduce structural reforms, to the moment in which these reforms really bite on everyday life of households and companies, it takes a long time. And sometimes it is even interrupted. So my main message here is the political elite and the political leaders must take a long-term horizon 
to sustain reforms so that growth itself is sustained. If that happens, then we could have very important results. This diagram, which is taken from the ECB uh, study, shows something which is possibly well known to, all, to many of us, that countries like Italy and Spain could be among the, the main beneficiaries of the next generation EU apparatus. Of course, this, uh, imply, this de derives from the fact that Italy in particular, but also Spain, are the major beneficiaries of the important resources put in, in place by the next generation EU program. The real bet is how to make a transformation of those resources into uh, investment and therefore into potent productive capacity. But maybe the uh, real challenge is another one. It is to involve the private sector in this new acceleration of growth in the economy. And to do this according to the so-called twin transformation, which has to do with digitalizing the economy and making it greener. As we know, this was a strategy which was launched by the commission by Ursula von der Leyen before the COVID crisis broke out. So it rests with the initial mandate and mandate of the current commission and was agreed by my member states. So we need to uh, align alongside structural reforms and public investments also a set of incentives that can be uh, such as to boost private investment as well as public investment. So this is crucial. Sometimes it is forgotten in the policy message. Also because there are a number of obstacles to climate investment which need to be overcome by putting in place alongside the uh, structural reforms and investment incentives for public investment or private investment. So let me uh, go rapidly to the conclusion, which can be summarized in a number of points. Next Generation EU, if activated, generates a positive shock to growth, which means it can deal with, we, we can kick off a sequence of accelerations, which can be sustained by structural reforms. This is to be seen through uh, the uh, impact on total factor productivity and institutional change. This strategy, if successful, is able to defeat the threat of uh, secular stagnation. But one element which has not been mentioned, and I'd like to draw your attention to, Next Generation EU will boost potential output over the medium to long term. This will be important, will be necessary, but will not be sufficient to boost effective growth, because it is possible that a a, a, a long-term output gap may generate, be generated by this strategy, and therefore we need additional instruments to fill the demand gap. And one additional instrument uh, is the, uh, the act activation of a, a centralized fiscal capacity to provide additional boost. If that is the case, this is a very common diagram, we will not suffer the lack of demand which is inherent in uh, advanced economies and we will, can benefit from the uh, next generation EU in full. So this is my message. I hope this is useful uh, to respond to Cinzia's kind remarks. This is the first step towards looking, asking the question, what will happen uh, from the global point of view? Well, one thing is sure, if there, if there is no additional demand boost, uh, Europe will witness uh, surpluses, per persistent surpluses in, in the trade balance, which will subtract demand from the internal demand apparatus. So we need to add that and link it to the po external position of the EU economy in the, global, in, the global, in the global system. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Pier Carlo. This, this was very interesting. Uh, I think it's, uh, uh, if I can summarize the messages that uh, the, your message is that the next generation EU can work is, as a catalyst of a virtual circle. Uh, but uh, of course, for, for this, we need to, to, to have the funds uh, properly spent and to, to have uh, uh, the full um, uh, mechanism for uh, reform implementation. I think the combination of the two can give credibility to a country and boost 
um, private investment. So in this sense, I think your, your message is, is really clear. Um, maybe an, an additional dimension which links back to what Paolo said, I think NGU can have economic impact, but it has also a very key political meaning at EU level. Uh, when it when it comes to the um, to the setup and use of EU common resources, which is part really of um, of EU integration. Let me now move to um, Rima Yadi. Um, Rim and a very dear friend. She is the, the president and the founder of EMEA, professor at Bayes Business School and uh, chairwoman of the banking stakeholder group uh, at the European Banking Authority. Rim, your, your book, um, your chapter in the book focuses on the EU-MED uh, relations. How do you see it? How do you see these relations to, to evolve? The floor is yours. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, Cynthia, for uh, moderating this session of uh, the book lounge. I would also would like to uh, extend my thanks to Paolo for the great journey since last year. We've been talking about uh, having uh, this book out, as, uh, especially in the timing where we are uh, nowadays. Uh, not only for the future of Europe uh, post-war, hopefully, uh, but also, as you said it uh, very clearly at the beginning of this session, a reset uh, of the uh, Euro-Med, Euro-Mediterranean and African uh, partnership and relations. So uh, this has been really a great journey because uh, in a way uh, we are all converging our views about uh, what we want uh, for the future of uh, the relations between Europe, the Mediterranean and Africa, but also on the east side uh, of what we've been seeing, um, the, uh, the war uh, in Ukraine and uh, uh, the current relationships in that part of the world. So uh, I only also like to thank Goran uh, for uh, working all together on this great journey. And hopefully this will um, allow us to enhance the discussions and really uh, the understanding between the different uh, regions uh, around uh, Europe, around the Mediterranean, in fact, because by the sea that unites us is the Mediterranean. And this is a, a great opportunity. Again, now this, I, I try always to see the opportunities and transitions. I think we are uh, living in a, a great transition uh, nowadays. It's really not only the digital transition, the climatic transition, or I would say, say the challenges that will have to take us into a, a sustainable transition that we are living today, but also a political and, and socioeconomic transition. So it's all together. And I think we need to uh, find a common understanding within this transition and also uh, to ensure uh, that um, trying, in fact, to dive uh, very carefully uh, within uh, what I call nowadays the multi-polar uh, world, geopolitical world, which uh, Cynthia has already mentioned at the beginning of the discussion. Of course, things are not so easy nowadays because, of course, uh, these uh, different groups, they have different agendas. Uh, different uh, values and eventually there is a point where there is a common understanding that we need to look for it nowadays. It's not uh, in fact a point where it's easy to be found but in, in realistically it is, it, we need to find it together uh, looking at models of convergence, interconnections, complementarities, common understanding and uh, eventually uh, integration. So we need to move uh, in fact from what I've seen over the last couple, I mean, one year, one year, two years, um, I've been seeing dealings uh, based on transactions rather than really uh, real partnership and friendship. That uh, yeah, what uh, what Paolo mentioned. We need to move uh, from this transaction type of thinking into really a real friendship, partnership, collaborations, uh, co-development uh, with the uh, Mediterranean and Africa. Now. You mentioned, uh, Paolo, the uh, reset. Uh, reset, yes. I mean, it, we, before before resetting, we need to understand what we have achieved over years of partnership and collaborations with the Mediterranean and Africa in terms of uh, the EU uh, the, the EU partnership, in terms of economic integration, 
uh, overall and also political. And I mean, now we can talk about political collaborations. Um, I must say that uh, years of, uh, of, of, of partnership has yielded very abysmal results in terms of the integration between uh, Europe, uh, the Mediterranean and Africa. If we look, for example, at the terms of trade and investments, and particularly we've seen it in the, um, in the way uh, these regions have been uh, connecting uh, uh, over the years now. When we go back 10 years ago with the Arab uprisings, uh, there has been an opportunity where Europe would have taken leadership or I would say a role, you know, an active, proactive role. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this, not, uh, this has not happened. And I remember how we've been debating this uh, idea to have Euromed Union back then in the 2010, but this uh, in, did not uh, really materialize. Uh, the relationship remained uh, fragmented, uh, bilateral, uh, at best sometimes regional for certain uh, projects, but then uh, in fact uh, more has to be uh, done in that sense. So if we look, for example, at the Mediterranean, and also I will uh, talk a little bit about Africa, because Africa uh, is, is linked to the Mediterranean. We have North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa, they are connected, in fact. So you have the different regions and you cannot disconnect the African continent uh, from itself. So, so really the Mediterranean is what connects them from a geographical standpoint. But uh, we need to look at Euro, I mean, Mediterranean and Africa as a whole, not uh, not as a, a separate uh, regional uh, entities. Eventually, they are different economically and socially, but then there is a, a potential for economic and financial convergence that we uh, could try to move forward o over uh, over the year. Now, um, I do not want to dive much into what the situation, uh, economic situation of uh, the Mediterranean. When I talk about the Mediterranean, it's, uh, from um, from the, I would say, from the east to the west uh, of the South Mediterranean. And, and here, um, I mean, the situation is quite gloomy from an economic standpoint. So we know very, very much what is happening in Syria and uh, Libya. Also uh, in Lebanon, this, uh, so, so the economic hardship of uh, Lebanon, also uh, the difficulties that is being encountered in, uh, in Tunisia and, uh, and, and, and Egypt. Uh, and also the uh, fragilities of other countries like uh, like Jordan and eventually more maybe Morocco. It's it's a standing still because of its positions and relationship also with other parts of the world. But at the same time, we just have to realize uh, that the Mediterranean is fragmented, has been fragmented, and it continues to be fragmented. And, and an action has to be really very much uh, uh, put in place. And all the uh, partnership that have been. Uh, agreed or uh, say signed uh, with the European Union. Uh, I mean, the impact of them uh, was, was was really, um, I would say, very uh, poor uh, up to up to today. So um, the uh, COVID nineteen pandemic, together with the war in Ukraine, has exacerbated the economic difficulties of of these uh, regions, and we've seen it very much into, for example, some of the uh, economic and financial difficulties of some countries in terms of, for example, some of them, they are really having uh, deals with the IMF or some others, they are not yielding to, uh, to a clear uh, outcome, for example, in the case of Tunisia. But uh, this only tells you uh, or tell us uh, that the economic difficulties will have to be on the plate of those countries in the years to come. And what I call a stabilizing action is needed nowadays and Europe could eventually take the leadership. And now we are seeing that uh, uh, the uh, IMF, uh, of course, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank are trying to uh, do more eventually. Uh, they have been pushed, in fact, to do more uh, within uh, thinking of, uh, you know, rethinking of the uh, global financial architecture. Uh, and, and this, in fact, uh, could uh, give way or a space to European Union to take a leadership role in that sense, to really further push and integrate uh, uh, those regions uh, from a different perspective. Uh, first, stabilizing, stabilization, which allows those uh, economies to uh, eventually uh, move forward with no much uh, of disruptions, economic and social dis disruptions. But then at the same time, to move uh, these regions into a sustainable and inclusive path, 
of uh, of investment of development and also of financing and and one of the proposals that we have uh, we have put in the book it's in fact to uh, develop uh, what i call a private public partnership fund which uh, allows those countries uh, to uh, in fact take a bit uh, more uh, i would say role into their financing or co-financing together uh, with guarantees from uh, eventually um, eventually the international organizations uh, also supported by uh, the European Union within the multi-financial annual framework. Uh, so, and this means that it's a complete different uh, way of looking at financing, uh, which, uh, which in fact go beyond aid, but mainly uh, into, you know, a long-term path of invest investment. So our proposal here is first stabilization uh, and then second uh, sustainable investment and financing. And this all, in fact, uh, builds on further integration, further economic integration through the trade channels and through the foreign direct investment channels, uh, but also via financial market. And this is, was uh, actually one of the key elements which we thought could really move uh, these regions toward a certain common uh, goal, a common path uh, in, in that sense uh, where we could uh, of these interactions and complement complementarities between the different regions. So looking a bit deeper, I mean, of course, the European Union has, um, has put in place the Green Deal. Uh, of course, the Green Deal is all about uh, trying to uh, get more diversified sources of uh, energy, clean energy, and also changing the uh, economic apparatus within the European Union. But this nowadays, so looking at uh, 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 the low autonomy or an energy autonomy or any of, of the European Union, we've seen it during the, the uh, Ukraine uh, war, I think we need to look at different alternatives uh, and the alternatives are not very far. This is really in our, in the neighbors, uh, probably having a much more, I would call it long-term view rather than a short-term view which allows uh, the, both regions, three, all the regions, in fact, Africa, Mediterranean, and Europe to have a common path. We are also thinking about eventually Euro, med, and eventually Euro made an African deal, a green deal together, uh, which is uh, really anchored in a common goal and a, a common uh, view of uh, what is sustainable uh, development, what is sustainable green development uh, for uh, for Europe, Mediterranean, and Africa. And this is what, in fact, uh, beyond having, I would say, words, of course, we need to build friendship, complementarities, and so on, but then have a, an, an action, an, a, a credible action, uh, to regain, in fact, the credibility and the strength and the, uh, between Europe, the Mediterranean, and, uh, and, and Africa. And it's, of course, uh, um, unfortunately, I don't see it uh, happening within the current set of uh, agreements and partnerships because, in fact, uh, these have not really uh, functioned very much over decades of collaborations. Uh, so it needs to have really a strong move toward uh, what I call a, a more credible partnership uh, with, uh, with, with, with Africa and the Mediterranean. Uh, and this is what we we've, we've been trying to also uh, say within this um, within this book. So I would like to uh, leave it there. So if there is any question, uh, since I can answer. Thanks very much, Rim. Um, I would like to, to invite those who are in the meeting to 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 think of of questions and uh, um, potentially raise hands. I would like to, to start with uh, uh, some questions from, from my side. Maybe I start from uh, from Dream, really going back uh, um, to what you, you just uh, said. I mean, we have, we have been working together for maybe almost a decade on uh, UMED uh, integration. And uh, we have been looking um, quite in detail at how uh, FDI and, and trade relations developed uh, between the, the EU and the, the MED region. Um, linked to basically the different kind of a partnership, the setup of this deep, uh, comprehensive trade agreements, which really never uh, happened. Now, the question is, uh, is the, the, the current setting so that this new world and with its challenges, maybe a mm -hmm. trigger or a sufficient trigger to, to make a step forward and maybe make this integration to happen? Or are we still facing 
the same obstacles that we had basically in 2019. Uh, and here what I have in mind is maybe what you mentioned at the end, especially when it comes to uh, maybe energy and sustainable development, where they're thinking of another kind of model, both for the EU and for uh, Africa and, and the Met region actually could trigger a new wave or a new thinking of uh, integration between the, the two shores of the Mediterranean. Uh, thank you, Cynthia, for, for, for this um, question. Uh, for sure, we need to build on what has, uh, what has been done previously. So of course, integration is economic, financial infrastructure. I think we need to uh, focus a bit on infrastructure integration, so trying really to uh, connect uh, uh, connect the regions as much as possible, um, particularly what we have seen uh, during the energy crisis. I think this is also another uh, driver that we, we need to uh, work on. Um, for the moment, uh, a green energy sources uh, is a, a, a pragmatic view on how uh, the collaboration and partnership could could happen. Uh, that's very clear. I think we have also discussed it at the Ideas Lab, and and I think there is a clear low uh, role nowadays for uh, for providing the uh, technologies uh, to the uh, to the African and Mediterranean countries. Of course, they have the sun, they have the natural resources, but then at the same time, we need the technologies and we need to have the infrastructure to channel all of this within the continent, but also vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, uh, Europe. A second thing is investment and financing. I think we have heard very much from, uh, from Paolo and also from Pietro for uh, the case of Europe. You, we need to have private uh, sector involvement. I think this is the right time to do it. Of course, uh, the private sector uh, involvement, they need certain guarantees, political or I call it, uh, I mean, say, Political or for the political risk. Now, these countries, they have a higher political risk, they have a higher financial risk, so somebody has to guarantee this risk. And I think uh, for the European Union, uh, with all what they have achieved within the European Investment Bank, European Investment Fund, the, the use of guarantees is essential. Uh, is essential because, uh, first of all, it's a, a, in a way uh, burden sharing uh, for external actions. And I think this is also something that needs to be put in place uh, to give further guarantees to the pri private uh, sector, but not uh, in isolation, please, not in isolation. It has to be done in close collaboration with the international organizations, means the World Bank and the IMF. So the World Bank and the IMF and other regional uh, financial institutions, like, for example, EBRD, uh, EIB and others, they have also a role to play uh, in this, what I call uh, as a... Um, as a promoter, so as promoters of integration, economic, financial, investment-based integration, and so on. So now another one is also, uh, I would refer to it as, um, as research and development and also transfer of technology. I think we need to move into what I call uh, integration in research, development, and innovation. And, and these are uh, uh, factors which will allow also the Mediterranean and Africa to create jobs and sustainable jobs. I think this is also important to solve the issue, uh, the, if there are issues. I, th I think I still believe that migration, it's a, it's a factor for growth. And I, I, we have discussed this for, for many years. I think the Mediterranean region has been a, um, I would say, has been uh, very rich and has been very diverse because of uh, hundreds of years of migration between uh, Europe, the Mediterranean, East, West, South, and, and, and this has created the richness, not only the richness from a human uh, development perspective, but also from an economic and financial perspective. And there is a great opportunity nowadays for the European Union, for the Mediterranean countries, and for African countries, and for the East uh, Eastern countries to work together. Um, I don't want to talk about common threat, because I think uh, w w I mean, the threats for me, it's coming much more from the climate change, uh, from the cybersecurity, uh, from all these uh, risks that we are not going to be able to see and to manage over time. And these are, for me, the global threats. Nowadays, uh, we need to try to connect, interconnect as much as possible and, and try to find um, the points of complementarities and the points where we can be close. 
And I think these are, for me, uh, infrastructure. So developing the infrastructure, developing research and development, uh, a green uh, 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 economy and green source of energy, technology, and then finance and investment. These are still and will remain uh, the pillars and also human development and interaction. So really uh, 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 migration. But of course, where is the limit? That's, uh, that's the problem that we need to look at. Thanks a lot, uh, Rim. Um, Paolo, I would like to, to go back to you because Rim uh, uh, mentioned several times, uh, um, made a reference to, to what you said. And in, in fact, you mentioned the role of the private sector um, in, in this process of uh, um, building a, a new partnership, friendship, cooperation with, uh, uh, with, with Africa. And Rim pointed to, to the role of guarantees. Uh, public guarantees. I would like to, to hear your, your views. I mean, you have been working in the private sector for, for many years. Um, is that enough? How, what should be the, the, the features of, of these guarantees in order for to have uh, the, the private sector on, on board? Well, I think the experience we have gained with the InvestEU, the so-called Juncker plan is, is quite relevant on, on this, but more broadly, uh, the role of financial integration, integrating banks, insurance companies, and capital markets um, is, uh, is uh, extremely important in leading the way towards also um, broader economic and, uh, and, and political integration. On this, uh, uh, I think actually what is happening um, now, I think, uh, in, in the world uh, shows how important is to, uh, to have integrated uh, uh, capital markets, not only from the point of view of exchanges and flows, uh, but also from the point of view of the institutional uh, framework to, to monitor and supervise and uh, regulate um, those, those flows. I mean, you, you see, we have um, in Basel agreed uh, on uh, prudential uh, uh, rules, uh, common rules uh, for the world, Basel 3 plus, if you want, and uh, it's a question now of implementing it, but uh, what's happening also shows how um, we are different in implementing uh, those rules in terms of supervision and, and convergence. Uh, and uh, so I think uh, we, we need uh, to make progress there, both internally completing banking union, we were very close and we are still very close to completing it, but we are not there yet. And, uh, and capital markets union, also um, now, in terms of um, uh, filling, bridging the financing gaps, uh, uh, you are right. There is a lot that the public and the private sector can do together. Provision of um, guarantees is one one thing, but uh, uh, but there are also other ways. We, we need a, a joint approach from the private sector and uh, from the public sector. You see. Um, there is an attractive formula. We need to go from billions to trillions because I think uh, the, the billions of uh, public money that we were able, thanks also for listening to the next generation you to put to put in place, uh, are not going to be enough if you want to fill the gaps, not only uh, at the EU level, but also more broadly at the pan-European level and looking towards the East and looking towards the Euro Mediterranean and in EU Africa, so that we can have a credible um, EU Africa and the pan-European Green Deal uh, and uh, digital transition, transition. So I think we need a, a new approach um, where you know, uh, public uh, uh, policies can work together with the private sector uh, to, um, to, to finance infrastructure, to finance small and medium enterprise, to finance innovation, and to provide stability, stability for Europe and the stability for the pan-European region. Thanks a lot. I would like now to, to move to, uh, to Goran. So um, I'm an economist by training and until a couple of years ago, uh, basically foreign policy was uh, just uh, a, an area where my colleagues were working on. Uh, since uh, uh, essentially one year, one year and a half, uh, the interlinkages I see between politics, global developments and economics has been growing exponentially. Uh, and I, I think you mentioned a couple of, 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 of 
things which made me really um, think about uh, how politics, geopolitics are becoming interconnected. And one is it's really the, the enlargement. Um, my impression is that the, um, in Brussels, uh, taking Brussels as uh, representative of the EU, there was an enlargement fatigue. So uh, I don't know exactly uh, the, the drivers, sorry, I'm, I'm not I'm sufficiently knowledgeable to, to explain this, but this was a sense, widespread sense, that the, the war was really a big uh, game changer. Uh, and uh, it basically was um, an eye opener uh, about how important uh, is actually to uh, keep um, credible, credible relationship and partnership with our Eastern neighborhood in particular. Uh, and this really brings me back to, to what you were saying, that the, the, how the EU had lost credibility some, somehow just uh, by bringing delays. Uh, and changing his mind uh, when uh, basically was about uh, the accession uh, process of, of certain countries. Uh, and now this, uh, I think things are, are changing. Now, the question is how the EU can uh, reestablish its credibility vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the partners before others uh, filled the void. Uh, and then the, the second point, is that uh, maybe one way actually to present things is that uh, there is a mutual benefit in uh, um, having a credible enlargement process and accession process. So that there is an interest for, for the countries who wants to join, and there is an interest for the EU to become bigger. And I think especially, I mean, sorry, my, my perspective is, is very much Brussels-based, and I think this uh, second element was lost. Uh, and uh, I think this really needs to, to, to become uh, under the, the spotlight, that there is a mutual gain, uh, if you want, from, from this uh, um, enlargement process. Second aspect, sorry, I'm a bit long, but uh, you really made me, me, made me think quite a bit. The second point is the linkage with the concept of strategic autonomy. This is uh, um, something new, which is, is gaining the central stage in the Brussels debate. Huh? Uh, so the, the, the war and the fact that China may be an unreliable partner has raised the issue of uh, the, the select, selection, if you want, of uh, our commercial partners, because trade can be weaponized, um, but also to, to, to make sure that uh, um, the supply of certain goods uh, um, um, or certain raw materials uh, actually is secured. And again, maybe uh, for the purpose of improving strategic autonomy of the EU, the relationship with the, uh, its partnership can play a key role. Uh, again, this uh, I think can revit revitalize or present the enlargement process under a different angle, which could make it uh, um, again beneficial for both sides. And on this, I would like to, to hear your views whether uh, this is something that makes sense or is actually off. Uh, well, thank you very much for the interest expressed and for the questions asked. I, I will try to give you really a very personal perspective. So basically, I can say I've been there, done that, meaning um, there are few of us who were in the Thessaloniki summit where I was. This was the first ever EU Western Balkan summit. Uh, then I was a foreign minister. And then there was no summit bringing together the EU leaders and the Western Balkans until 2018, so 15 years. There was a gap, basically. Now, there was no uh, a habit of having a gathering of ministers of interior from the region with the, their peers from the EU or ministers of culture from the region and their peer, peers from the EU. There was nothing like this. Interesting enough, during that time, there was gathering of uh, ministers of the EU, of certain portfolio, and Ukrainian ministers of that portfolio, which I applaud and support. But what I'm telling you, it's been 15 years since uh, between the two EU-Western Balkan summits. And then again, I was there, 
but now in a different capacity. This was, I was saying that we are only a few of us who were in both summits, 2003 and 2018, and actually we were counting, we were three in a room. Then I, but I, then I was uh, as a secretary general of the Regional Cooperation Council, and I, I was delighted. But when I received the invitation, then I was in two minds. Then I brought, I was in Sarajevo with my team, and I brought colleagues from the Regional Cooperation Council, and I told them, look, guys, there is a good news, and there is a very good news. <laughs> Meaning, I told them very frankly, look, I'm super happy I've got the invitation for the summit. I will be talking to Merkel, Macron, to the leaders, to the president of the council and the president of the commission. That's good news. But let me tell you what I fear is behind. It is that actually, as they have invited me as the secretary general of the regional cooperation council, and the reason being to present uh, at that time multi-annual pl action plan on regional economic area, which is now referred at as a common regional market. So they wanted to present common regional market to them, but then it means that there will be not much of a debate on the regatta principles and individual enlargement process. And this is exactly what happened. You know, in diplomacy, particularly in Brussels, there is always a way to tell you what or not to say. So I was invited to speak in a summit, but basically the message, not only to me, but to the heads of states and the governments from the region where I come from, the West Balkans, was this is not the E word summit. So basically, yes, this is E West Balkan summit, but you are not going to talk about enlargement because there is nothing we can offer, which was odd because only months before this gathering, there was a uh, Paolo referred that Juncker also this European Commission credible enlargement perspective. And then they put the figure 2025. And the leaders from the region came being very enthusiastic, but the message was, look guys, forget about this. This is commission paper. We, meaning heads of states of the EU, uh, the EU member states, we've never said anything about this paper. Frankly, we don't like it. Frankly, we don't support it. I mean, I'm sorry to be this personal, but I'll go further so that you understand this psycholog psychology and emotions. Prime Minister of Albania, Edi Rama, has used the word in his presentation, looking at President Macron and uh, Councillor Merkel, nine times the word kill. I mean, you don't do it. You don't use this word in diplomacy on that level. He said it nine times. What he wanted to say, you are killing hopes of my nation. You are killing hopes of all of us in the region with this attitude. So there was, uh, well, there was a lot of discussion. But so what I'm referring at is a feeling of frustration. And then what came after 2018, there was a positive development. And I applaud to both the council and the commission. And this positive development was that now we are gathering every year. That's great. And then... I'm sorry to say, but the, the war triggered different emotional attitude among the EU citizens. And this is, uh, Cynthia, I think something you are referring at. And this is more of an openness among the citizens of the EU, more of an awareness. Well, let's make sure that we have all our neighbors with us and not at the other side. So now uh, we have this Balkan barometer and there is Eurobarometer. So we are measuring uh, public perception. Now there is more of a support, there is an increase among the EU citizens towards the whole issue of enlargement. But then uh, there are also reflections and the consequences of the process that I was just commenting. And this is that, on the other hand, in the region, support is, it looks like it is going down, not to zero level, there is a lot of support. But I'm just telling you that this disappointment has left the mark uh, among the people. So this is where we were. And now uh, there is this situation that I wanted to describe by saying critical dependencies of the EU, inward-looking uh, European leaders after the COVID and then the war, looking at, okay, what we should see in the two winters. Will there be a dissatisfaction among the people? Will there be protests? Elections are coming in different countries. You just had one in Italy. There are more elections coming in the next 12 to 16 months. 
So what I'm saying, it is only normal when you are on the political scene that you look what is going to be a consequence of both pandemic in the world to your people and who is going to be elected. And is this going to be a government which will be able to even think of the processes which have been mentioned here? Rim, I applaud to you when you were referring at migration. I fully support this attitude. I think that this understanding of to what the extending migration is important and is enriching both shores, the destination country as well as countries of origins, need to be discussed in depth, but needs to be discussed in all regions, including in Brussels, coming back to you, what you said, Cynthia. So what I want to say is there is a need to discuss these issues, to broaden understanding. I came with uh, something which was kind of a common knowledge in the region, about these six fixes for the six issues in the Western Balkans, there are other ideas. It is only an attempt to recreate engagement on both sides, among the leaders in the EU member states, including in the Commission, and among the leaders and the people on both sides, citizens of the EU as well as the citizens of the Western Balkans, and I'm now also referring at Easter Partnership and the other countries. So the politics is very important, and these political developments, as well as these economic developments, and I was very much looking into what's been presented by uh, uh, Car Pier Carlo, because I really respect this. I mean, when you speak figures and you explain what was happening in the last several decades in the EU, perhaps might give us an explanation why we've ended up in these two different corners. But also, I like uh, his uh, explanation of what the new generation of the EU might bring in. So they do have a different geopolitical picture, and I'm not at all negative. There will be a deep thinking of how we are to continue this integration process. When I say integration, it doesn't have to mean membership. But it has to be, and Paolo referred that uh, political partnership, and there are other ideas, but this has to be a process of integration, which will have two important components, and I insist on two. It's not only common market, it's not European market, it's not only economy, it is very much about fundamentals, meaning the rule of law, because I try to talk to the people who are living from the region, there are many, their population is important and migration from the region into the EU members and basically they're referring at uh, what can broadly be understood as rule of law they're referring at the banking system health system insurance system transport system education system and this is how they explain themselves why they've left so basically they're referring at the values of the EV, eu we know which they haven't seen in the last several decades coming in to their region, therefore they left. So I'll stop here in order that we can continue this discussion. But I'm looking very optimistically into the future, hoping that the war will end, that we will reach this point, and that we will rethink our uh, close relationship between Eastern, Western Balkans, and then Africa, as the Euro Mediterranean as has been explained here, with the EU. And therefore, my last sentence here, well, I highly appreciate a very good article in this book written by Paolo on identity of Europe. We need to rethink identity in a broader term, so this is what he has done in this article. Thank you. Thank you very much, Goran, for this uh, very exhaustive, uh, but also and comprehensive uh, um, explanation. We are uh, reaching the, the, the end of, of, of this uh, webinar. Um, I think uh, um, despite the, the, the challenges that Europe and its neighborhood regions and, and Africa are facing, you are given a, a, a lot of positive, uh, you have highlighted a lot of positive elements. Uh, uh, Pier Carlo with um, um, NGU, um, uh, Paolo with his very positive uh, attitude about uh, further integration, um, RIM as well, uh, looking at, uh, at, at the MED regions uh, and uh, what it can be done. And, and now uh, Goran with a uh, perspective from the um, Eastern neighborhood. Uh, uh, so overall, I think there are a lot of opportunities out there 
I think the real challenge for the policymakers is not to miss the train. Uh, so in this sense, action is required and very soon. And on this, I would like to thank you very much uh, for staying with us and don't forget to, to, to read the book. Many thanks, uh, Rim, Coren, Paolo and uh, Piercarlo for your contribution and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you very much, thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank, thank you. you.